For the second lecture in this series on hydrology, we're going to get into surface waters. Today will be surface waters one, and then in the textbook, this is section 11.5. Basically, 1% of all fresh water is surface water. And so if we were to look at this graphically, we could draw a pie, and this pie is all water, and most of it's salt water. And this little bit is fresh water. All right? Salt water is 97.5% of all water on Earth. 2.5% is fresh water. Now, the fresh water can make its own pie. And we know something about this pie. 80% of this pie is ice, all right? Frozen as glaciers and as ice sheets. And this 20% 20% of this pie, essentially, we'll say 19% of this pie because I'm heading towards 1%. 1% of this pie is uh, surface water. So this other 19% of this pie, this is ground water. And so what we're going to talk about today is surface water. We're not going to talk about lakes. We're not going to talk about swamps, which actually dominate surface water. We're going to talk about the water that moves in streams. The reason why this matters is because this is the water that carves the surface of our earth, that makes erosional features like waterfalls and canyons. It's also the water that deposits things to make floodplains and deltas. So it is geologically active, even though it is not much in terms of its overall percent. And the key for surface waters is when you have a situation where precipitation is much, much greater than infiltration, then water will exist on the Earth's surface, right? Infiltration is going to lead to groundwater, which is a topic for another day. So we're in this situation where precipitation outpaces infiltration, and we get this word, runoff, where water is running across the surface of the Earth. Runoff will occur in two different ways. Initially, it occurs as sheet wash. And the key with sheet wash is it doesn't last very long. Um, there's no channelization. That's what sheet wash is. In the first 10 minutes of a big thunderstorm, maybe you get these puddles that start to cover all the land. That's what sheet wash looks like. If the water's probably moving, it just has not yet channelized. Now, once channelization occurs, we get rills and streams. And so the other way, so let's just say this. Let's say we get channelized water, and the first bits of channelized water occur in little streams. These um, are the littlest channels, and these are called rills. They're on the order of like a centimeter across, maybe 10 centimeters across. They're fairly small features. They're not very long in their length. These are the start of stream channels. And we'll just call streams or channels everything else. One thing you're going to find in today's lecture is that there's a lot of words that mean the same thing as other things within this hydrology. And that's probably because rivers matter so much to us, we have many names for these different features. Now, once we have a stream channel, we can get a stream channel network. And a stream channel network is like a tree, where there is a main trunk of a tree and branches feed into that tree. And no matter how small you go, we get more and more branches of streams being fed into the mainstream. All right, so why don't you take a minute here and draw this with me. We want to draw a river channel network or a stream channel network. It looks branched. Oh, that one's in the wrong direction. The things are flowing downhill. And this is high topography. This is low topography. We might call this down here the mouth of the stream. And it's probably entering into a lake or into an ocean. These features that are the smaller channels that are feeding into the main branch, these are features that we call tributaries. Tributaries are the feeder channels. Uh -huh, they're smaller. And then let's see, we could label this as the main channel. You can take a second here and pause and make yours a little cleaner and neater. One thing I do want to point out here is that there is this distinguished area I'm going to put it here in blue. And all water that falls within this blue area, all will exit through this mouth right here. And, and this blue dotted line is a topographic high. And it defines for us 
the size of our basin. We could call it a drainage divide. And in fact, I wanna put four words here that basically all mean the same thing. Anytime you have a channel network, all right, that's what we've just drawn on the side. We have a channel network. All of the channel network sits within an area that we call a watershed. Now, almost synonymous with the watershed is this word tributary network. Right, that's very similar to channel network, right? So here's channel network. We could call that a watershed. We could call that a tributary. We could also call, and it means something slightly different, but this idea is a drainage basin. Drainage basin would be this area marked in blue. It's the catchment that holds, or any water, we can put this in as well, catchment, any water droplet that drops within the area of the drainage basin, separated from the neighboring drainage basin by some topographic high, which we could call a divide, will flow through a mouth. And drainage basin and catchment are synonymous with one another. Okay, that's one way to geographically describe, describe parts of streams. Here's another way to look at a stream. Instead of looking at a bird's eye view, let's look down on the surface. This is called a longitudinal, longitudinal profile because we're looking at the long view of the river. So if here are, is the high topography, we'd call this the headwaters. And there is a decreasing topography across the landscape until we get down to like an ocean down here. And this would, um, this ocean level, there's below, okay. This is called base level. And every river flows to its base level, which is often the ocean, but it doesn't have to be, it could be a lake. Now, in the highlands and the headwater, rivers are marked by erosion. It tends to be because they're steeper terrain. Steeper terrain leads to more gravity. More gravity is faster water. And so I'm just going to put the word fast. And once we get down closer to base level, this is an area of rivers that are marked by deposition. And in part, it's because the water is slowing because there isn't much gravity um, that's pushing it anymore. And so when we think about the longitudinal profile of any given river, we should expect to see different features higher up where, the wa where there's less water because there's been less time to capture. And as we get mile upon mile downstream, maybe even thousands of miles if we're dealing with the Nile or the Mississippi, we're gonna see different kinds of features produced. Okay, good. Now, let's talk about two more aspects of how we measure and then this lecture will be done. Because now we've defined some parameters in terms of their geography, both from bird's eye view and side view. And now let's just, how do we measure? We measure it in two different ways, I suppose. We, well, they're kind of related. So the first thing I want to say is that when we measure a river, we measure it with respect to its discharge. It's like the Richter scale for earthquakes, but for rivers. And we give the symbol of discharge is a Q. I'm not sure why it's not a D, but anyways, it's a Q. And what discharge is, it's a measure of volume. And so it is, in the United States, we measure it in cubic feet per second. In other places in the world, it makes more sense, of course, scientifically to say meters cubed per second. And the question we're asking is at any given point in the river, how much water is moving through it? And it's somewhat easy to calculate. In fact, you're gonna do it in lab. So let's say we have we're looking at a cross section through a river. And here is our river, it's flowing straight towards us. Well, this area of water, right? This is, this is some area. And the river is moving towards us at some speed, all right? So some velocity. And so if we take the cross sectional area of the stream channel, multiply by how fast the water is coming through that, you get some value Q. And different rivers have different numbers here. And well, let's, I could say some, the Mississippi River, 17,000, let's see. So the M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I, -S 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 let's just call it the Mississippi River. This is 17,000 cubic meters per second at its max. Well, the Amazon, this is the biggest river by discharge in the world. It is 175,000 cubic meters per second. The river here in Austin, it is called the Colorado River. 
it is 11 cubic meters per second. So much smaller than, the, than those mighty rivers. And what you're gonna be doing in a lab exercise, so we're gonna be going out to a local creek and you're gonna be measuring the discharge of that creek. And that day, we don't know how fast the river's gonna be moving through it, but you're gonna have an exercise like this one here below where you're gonna to have to measure the width of the river. Here it's 10 meters. And the depth of the river in this example is three meters. So what does that equal? That is 30 meters. And we multiply by how fast the river is going, which is one meter per second. And that gives us 30 cubic meters per second. We could do this other example. You pause this video. Did you get 180 cubic meters per second? I think that's what you get. Nine times 10 is 90 times two meters per second. That's gonna be 180 cubic meters per second. That's how discharge is measured. Now the way to get a large, uh, a very large discharge like the Amazon, well, we need to have a very large drainage basin or catchment, and that works for the Amazon. It's like half of South America. And you need to have the more precipitation you have in that catchment and the Amazon, you have tons of precipitation. Now the catchment of the Nile might be more than the Amazon. I actually don't know the number right now, but I do know that there's a lot of Sahara Desert in the way, which would have lower precipitation. That's why the Nile has a much lower discharge. All right, so the, the last concept now for today is gonna be how we measure this in a graph. And anytime we talk about discharge as a function of time, we're often describing a river or a stream as a, with a graph called a hydrograph. And within a hydrograph, what we see is that there's some number that the river exists at. But if rain were to fall, that river, right, will have to increase its flow rate to accommodate that. And then the rainfall ends and the river returns back to its base flow level. This is what a hydrograph tends to look like. Our time here, this is hours to days in its duration. And this spike is our river flood in response to precipitation. So there's a couple things I just wanna label on the here with you. This area that's below the line, this is called base flow. And it is the normal flow for the river. And the area within this peak, this would be the storm event or the flood event, volume of water. There tends to be a lag between when precipitation occurs and when the main flood occurs. And that lag is between hours to days and hydrologists get excited about why the, a lag is one hour versus 10 hours, depending on where we are. And then, okay, so then this, so this is the flood occurring, this is our peak flood, and then now here, this is the recession of the waters. So we could say the waters are receding. In a river, when we do have our fastest and our slowest parts of the water, this is the last term for today, this is a tailwig. And what the tailwig is, I'm gonna show you a river in two views. So, whoop. so here is a river channel. The area where the water is the fastest in that river is right here. And that area is called the tailwig. So we're gonna call tailwig as fastest part of stream. And it has to do with momentum and it has to do with friction. Where here things are slower because of friction and here things are the fastest. If we were to look down on a bird's eye view of a meandering stream, here's our meandering stream. It's curving as the water washes down the river. Well, the talweg sits in the center of a stream until there's a bend. And momentum carries the talweg into this bend where it hits here and then it crosses back over and it hits here and it crosses back over. So what I would like you to know about the talweg is that it should be, uh oh, what do I do here? It should be in the center of a straight stream channel. But in the bend, we could say momentum carries into bends. Momentum carries into bends. 
The reason why this is gonna matter is because where water is fastest, it erodes the most. Where water is slowest, it deposits sediment the most. And so the towel leg is gonna define for us river features.